Welcome to Critical World Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where I break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 50, Best Laid Plans. Also, here's a fun fact. This is the 200th video I've made on my channel. Assuming you don't count the channel trailer, but you do count the three-minute video I made rounding up a bunch of tweets about the OGL scandal, the silliest video on my channel. That's the metric I use to count my videos. So yeah, happy 200. Anyway, in the spirit of anniversaries, let's talk about the 50th episode of Critical Role. This episode features a new theme song video which features the cast dressed as their characters in full makeup and costume and props with visual effects for their spells and abilities and a CGI tentacle monster. It's rad as hell, still one of my favorite intro videos they've ever had. Ashley is back at the table and as the game opens, Matt fills her in on the spell slots she would have used and the damage she would have taken during the Sphinx encounter. It's a bit clunky, but since they weren't sharing virtual character sheets at this point, it's a necessary evil. There's no great way to do it at this point in the show. The party takes a short rest outside the Sphinx's cave, and Grog finally takes the short rest he'd been postponing for ages, because a short rest means losing the strength bonuses to Craven Edge, but he needs to rest. The blade shrinks, Craven Edge gasps in hunger, and Grog has to make a constitution saving throw. But Travis rolls a natural 20, resisting the effect. Matt describes a familiar sensation, similar to the moments darkness took him in the fight with Kavarn. He almost felt himself get pulled into the sword, but he was able to resist. Travis asks if his exhaustion resets on a short rest, but no, that only happens at a long rest. That's when exhaustion gets dealt with. And then horror sets in as Travis realizes he had disadvantage on that saving throw thanks to his exhaustion. Now, I don't actually think that's the case. I think during the last session, Travis just Mandela affected himself into thinking he had three levels of exhaustion. So in this session, Travis is correctly remembering that he had been rolling with disadvantage for saving throws because of three levels of exhaustion, but I think he was mistaken the first time. Or maybe he got a third level and I didn't notice, but I'm not sure when that would have happened. Matt also didn't seem to notice in the last episode that Travis was rolling saving throws with disadvantage, so when Travis brings it up here, Matt assumes Grog must have gone into a frenzied rage during the Sphinx battle, and that's where he would have gotten the third point of exhaustion. But looking back, Travis was already rolling with disadvantage on saving throws well before the fight, so... There was some sort of miscommunication or misunderstanding during the last session, and that's just carried over to this game. Side note, this is one of the reasons people liked that version of uh, 1D&D's Exhaustion, where you just subtract one from every d20 roll with every level of exhaustion, because getting the number of levels of exhaustion wrong wouldn't be nearly as extreme a difference. Because the reason all of this matters at all is because Travis believes that he has disadvantage on saving throws. You have to roll again? He's exhausted. Well, he's yeah. <gasps> Fuck. No. What is You're it? Lying. It's a one. It's You're a one, lying. It? He rolled a one. You are lying to <laughs> what me. Are the odds? What are the odds? <laughs> like five percent. Give it percent. And it takes five percent both times. Everybody roll for initiative. <laughs> no joke, though. As you guys finish your rest, and you're all gathering the next stage of your advancement, um. You watch as Grog stands up and starts walking into the snow of the forest, with the blade out, topples and falls to one knee, then falls face first in the snow. Ah! Grog? Grog? I, 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 I run over to him. We all run out, we run out. Run yeah, out. yeah, yeah. He's still, he's cold. There are no signs of life. Grog is dead. The party scrambles, and Pike pulls the sword away from him, and they start talking about what they can do. Can she greater restoration him, or heal him? And Matt does not want to tell players how to play, so he gently asks Ashley a couple of times what spells she has prepared. She would throw out a healing or restorative spell, but then he would respond by saying that those spells work on living people. And he asks again, what spells does she have prepared? Waiting to hear a very specific combination of words, but they never came. So the party starts talking about other options. Vax says take him somewhere, take him to Gilmore, but Keyleth doesn't have any fast travel options prepared. Percy takes the sword and stares it down, keeping it separate from Grog and watching to see what it does. Vex and Scanlan run into the cave to try to get a hold of the Sphinx, but the stairs leading down into the temple are gone. It's just a simple cave. They can never see the Sphinx again. And then, finally, Ashley looks back at her lower level spells and realizes she does have a way to help Grog. Wait, wait, I have Revivify. Okay. Learned? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Has it been enough time? I'm gonna you, whisper you, to you, you touch a creature that has died in like a minute. Within the yes. last minute. Has it, it, it been a minute? It, it hasn't been a minute It just did it, it just happened! It's really, hasn't even been, it's barely been a minute. We all ran over! No, no, I wasn't us, even no, looking at my us. third levels. No, Ashley, go ahead and roll an initiative check. 
In a couple of my videos, I pointed out some times where Matt was strict about something, and I would refer to Matt as being a bit of a hard ass, maybe just about that specific subject. And I got a bunch of comments from folks pointing out that Matt really is not a harsh DM. It, he's pretty lenient, and he lets his players do lots of things that a harsh DM would not. And I think that's true on the whole, and I especially think that's true right at the very beginning of the Vox Machina campaign, and it becomes more true about his style again over the course of the show. But right now, I do feel like we're in an era of the show where he will have moments that I don't just read as strict, but unnecessarily strict. Now he's going to walk this back in a minute, so keep that in the back of your mind. He's going to end up kind of ignoring the initiative result that he called for because I suspect he seemed to realize that he was being a little bit too strict. And that's okay, we should be able to do that when we go overboard. Because, like, I totally get Matt's concern about not wanting to tell a player how to play. He does not want to turn to Ashley and say, the best thing for you to do right now is cast this spell. We saw the same instinct in the Slayer's Take episode when Vax and Keyleth were possessed, and Matt kept hinting that Kashaw might have a spell that could turn these undead away from the party, but he waited three turns to actually tell Wilfred L, you have a class feature that can solve this problem. Similarly, Matt wants Ashley to feel free to choose what to do with her own character. And also, if she's not calling out Revivify, it's possible she didn't have it prepared after all. Although maybe Matt knew she had it prepared, I don't know. But either way, he doesn't want to guide her hand. He wants her to take the initiative, no pun intended. But then Matt was fully prepared to rule that, no, Ashley took too long to find the spell she needed, so she can't resurrect Grog. I know Matt didn't want to break the illusion of the world by implying that the party was able to do a whole bunch of stuff in one minute, and... Yeah, given everything the party was trying to do, they were starting to run up against that time limit. I do think it's fair to wonder whether it had actually been a minute for the characters, because if it wasn't yet, then it would be very soon. If this were normal circumstances, the initiative rule ruling is a decent solution. Now, when Matt starts to imply that the spell won't work because it's been more than a minute, the whole cast starts basically trying to pitch Matt to be more lenient with the time frame. But everybody dropped the subject when he said that this would be handled with an initiative rule. Why is that? because the dice will be objective, and they will tell us if Pike acted soon enough. Again, under normal circumstances, this is a perfectly reasonable ruling. But these aren't normal circumstances. This is the first time Ashley has been back at this table in person in three months. She hasn't brought anybody back from the dead in 11 months, since the Kavarn fight where Grog had that moment of darkness where he died. And if you don't want to give her any help, that's fine. I do think it's not the end of the world just to tell her to keep looking at her spells for the answer. Like, I don't really know what a better solution is if your main concern is robbing the player of their agency. But if you're not going to help an inexperienced player, at least don't hinder them. Don't hold them back because they didn't react as quickly as a more seasoned player might. In fact, time at the table doesn't even necessarily mean that people are thinking about Pike's resurrection spells. Because nobody else in the party asked if Pike had that spell, despite all of them knowing about that spell. They saw it in action much more recently when Kashaw resurrected Vex. Now, maybe some of the players thought of it and figured, well, okay, Ashley would bring it up if she had it prepared. But I'm not so sure that all of the cast would have assumed that, and those folks didn't suggest it to Pike either. Because they were panicking. Because Grog just died. Speaking of not suggesting things, I really like how silent Travis is during this scene. He's doing a nice job of just sitting back and letting the others figure it out without him. Speaking of figuring things out, Matt does seem to realize that it's not necessary to get the initiative roll, so it seems like he does just kind of drop it. Can I assist with a whisper to the sword? Uh, sure. Can I inspire her? Sure. <laughs> okay. You do first. I just I just hold her hand and I look in her eyes and okay, okay. and I, I just say, please, Pike, please, please. I love him as much as you do. And Take your D10 if you want to go ahead and use that now, or make this as part of the resurrection ritual, which we're now undergoing. Oh my God! Can I do this first, just to see? Well, this this is. Um, well, what did you roll for your initiative? Yeah, 14. 14. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong, but I do kind of get the feeling that he was about to drop the idea of using initiative to resolve this, and I think that's the right call. Given all the mitigating circumstances, it does not feel right to potentially punish Ashley for not moving fast enough when she's only barely had a chance to play Pike in the past year. This is why I think people are generally right when they say Matt Mercer isn't a harsh DM, but I do think that throughout this era, his first reaction is to be kind of strict, and then to think better of it. We saw the same pattern with the Basilisk Blindsight debate and the Sphinx Initiative reset, and there are a few other examples from this era of the show as well. I think some of it comes from the pressure to run D&D rules as written because people are shouting D&D rules at him on Twitter every day, and then he'll try to stick with a ruling as written, see that it bums his players out, and walk it back. This is something we're going to talk about more in the future because this pattern had some unintended consequences when it came to the perception of one player in particular, but 
more on that another time. Anyway, now that Matt has allowed Pike to try to cast Revivify on Grog, the group moves on to a Resurrection skill challenge. Now, I think I've said this before, but in the future, Matt will change his rules so that Revivify does not require a full ritual. It only requires a single roll on the part of the caster, and if they fail that roll, then Revivify can't be used on the corpse anymore, but other spells could potentially bring them back to life. But Matt was still polishing his Resurrection rule, so in this case, Revivify still requires the players to undertake a ritual. Vex pours some of Grog's ale into Grog's mouth, and Matt rules that this is a persuasion roll, which... Makes perfect sense to me. Grog loves ale, so let's try to tempt him back to life with something he loves. Vax excuses himself from the group and petitions the Raven Queen. He will set aside his reservations about her if she brings him back. You could argue this is a persuasion, but Matt does not allow repeated skills for resurrection rituals. Otherwise, everybody would give a tearful speech and roll persuasion back to back to back. So he calls this a religion check, which, again, makes a lot of sense to me. Vax finds himself in darkness, and the Raven Queen only says, I believe that every death has its place which could be good or could be bad. She's hard to read, that goddess of death. And since the sword steals strength, Scanlan feeds Grog a potion of fire giant strength, which Matt calls a medicine check. Again, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. You could argue that a potion might be an arcana roll, but in this case, medicine feels like a more accurate way to reflect Scanlan's goal. Matt rolls the final resurrection ritual roll behind the screen, and then Matt narrates Grog waking up and starting to choke Scanlan instinctively before his sense is clear and he's back to his old self. And now it's time for the long overdue Craven Edge intervention. Grog wants Craven Edge back and doesn't like that Percy's having a stare down with his sword. Well, I mean, he's obviously messing with other people's property and I walk over to the sword. No, no, no! Oh, good. I, I run over and I block it. I stand next to Percy and I block the sword. What? Well, yeah, I walk over and I'm I stop pulling Grog. out daggers and standing behind Please. my sister. Grog, <laughs> Grog, let it go. No. Let what? This has been something You're on the tip of our tongue. Sword. For weeks, let it go. Whatever that thing is, is fucked. Let it go. But it's my sword. It's a great scene. Time codes are on screen. I'll hit the highlights, but it's a great sequence. You should watch the whole thing when you get a chance. It comes to light that Percy, Scanlan, and Pike already knew about the sword. Specifically that they knew it talks and that it thirsts for blood. So the half-elves, who coincidentally are often the consciences of the group, don't know that they were out of the loop. It seems like Vax especially is a bit uneasy about the fact that Percy gave Grog an evil, intelligent weapon and seemed to think nothing of it. Though, he doesn't get too far into it today, since that is not the argument they're having right now. So the group starts discussing ways to cleanse or banish the sword, but they haven't convinced Grog to part with it yet. Okay, look, if, if you get bucked off a horse, right, you don't kill the horse, you just train it up a bit. Like, let's just... Let's just work with the sword. Horses don't try to steal your soul, Grog. Grog argues that they should question the sword about what the Briarwoods were doing, which he's tried and failed to do a few times. But finally, Grog confesses that he just wants the sword for the Kevdak fight. He confesses that he doesn't care if he dies against any other monster, not even the dragons. But he does not want to die to Kevdak. And I love that moment of vulnerability from Grog. But when Pike says that she doesn't want him to die because of Craven Edge, Grog accepts that he's going to have to give up the sword and allows the group to do what they want. Again, Travis Willingham, role-playing his character and doing exactly what feels right, but also not putting himself as a priority over the group. A++. Keyleth has a 7th level spell, Plane Shift, that can either bring 8 people to another plane, or permanently banish an individual to another plane. The spell says you can banish a creature, but Matt says, yeah, it's a 7th level spell, I don't see why you couldn't cast it on an object instead. And her pitch is to send it to the pocket dimension where they fought the Dread Emperor in a pre-stream game. Aside from the Dread Emperor, that dimension seemed uninhabited. They tossed a few other ideas around, but that seems to be their best one. Before they do this, though, Pike wants to cast Greater Restoration on the sword. She's been wanting to use that spell to solve this problem ever since Grog died, and they're not really sure what it's going to accomplish, and a few of the players are actively worried that it might free whatever entity might be inside the sword, but they say, you know, sure, go ahead, let's try it. Pike casts the spell, and she sees a flash of a person in a long-ago past, a selfish, greedy person making a deal with a powerful entity and a punishment as their soul was bound to a blade and they were cursed with endless hunger. And Matt narrates a dark thread connecting Grog to the sword, which she severs. Grog collapses for a moment and then shakes it off, and Matt turns to Grog and tells him, That fucking blade ate your soul. <laughs> what? <laughs> you wonder this entire time how you could be so foolish to give in to something that this whole time has been using you. How could I have been so foolish <laughs> this whole time that fucking blade has been using me? Now this is interesting. 
because I looked online for the information we've got about Craven Edge, and I didn't see anything in the stats about a curse or a force that overpowers the will of its wielder. Well, I mean, okay, obviously the sword is cursed, it ate Grog's soul when he took a short rest. But mechanically, there's no reason Grog wouldn't have been able to make that leap of logic himself. However, there were several moments during the campaign when Grog tried to give up Craven Edge, even momentarily, even just when switching to a different weapon while fighting Earthbreaker Groon, for example, and Matt would call for a saving throw. When Grog failed, as he did I think just about every time, Matt described that Craven Edge's force of will was too overpowering, and Grog kept fighting with this very obviously evil sword. So this is a nice way for Matt to close the book on that, and let Travis know that he no longer has to play Grog as if he has that supernatural influence over his mind. Now I'm not even sure how often Travis did play Grog that way, but it certainly came up every time he started to get iffy about Craven Edge and failed a role to resist its influence. Now I do worry that saying something like this, telling a player that they no longer have to play their character a certain way, could easily fail to land properly. For example, Grog confessed to his reluctance to face Kevdak without Craven Edge, and if I told my players, you realize you've been seduced by Craven Edge, I wouldn't want them to feel like I was asking them to retcon their character's vulnerabilities. Thankfully, Matt and Travis have a really good dynamic and a lot of trust, so I don't think Travis feels like Matt is saying, all the reasons you wanted to hold onto Craven Edge were just a symptom of mind control. That would not be very satisfying, and I could see a player taking the wrong lessons away, but thankfully, I think Travis understood that he can still be himself, he just no longer has any supernatural influence, and he can choose to play with that however he wants to. Oh, also, fun fact, while I was looking for the sword stats on the Critical Role wiki, I found a note that Craven Edge is an anagram for Vecna Greed. Might be a coincidence. Maybe. Hey, hey, Matt, it's a coincidence, right? The sword was just named Craven, even though he was in no way cowardly, but just because just it sounds like craving and for no other reason, right? Right, Matt? Hey, Matt, Keyleth banishes the blade to the Palace of the Dread Emperor, and I've always loved that Matt describes it spinning away into a void of stars, basically like Zod in the Phantom Zone, from the movie where they put him into a floppy disk, not the movie where they put him into a dildo. And the party takes a long rest in the mansion. Pike gives Grog the Gauntlets of Ogre Power to make up for the loss of strength, and he gives her the Boots of Levitation in exchange. Keyleth also casts Greater Restoration and brings Vax back to his normal age. Percy works on making a seat for Vex's broom, though it's going to be a multiple day process, but there's at least a tether that will keep the broom with Vex if she falls, like the strap surfers wear. Scanlan writes some sort of note using a quill on parchment, but more on that a little bit later. Matt also gives Travis the full Craven Edge item card so Travis can see what the sword did to him. There's no way Grog would have this information at this point, so Matt is just telling him as a player, just for fun. Although, I want to reiterate, it was possible for Grog to learn this information. All he had to do was take the sword to Gilmore or Allura and get it identified. It actually would have been trivially easy to do. This, this is a lot yes, to I'm leave off. That's a lot. That's well, a you lot. know. To not have. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big fucking difference. <laughs> Would you have kept? Is, would you have kept it if you had known all those other things, or would you have wanted you to use more of it? You don't know. Mind your own this business, is, nosy this is, this is, by the way, the benefits of identify spells <gasps> and things yeah. like that. Oh, shit. oh well, if only I had used my identify spell. <laughs> but going forward, like if you have something you don't know about, you can always go to people with those abilities and be like, "Could you see what the fuck this does?" Do any of our people have identify? Uh, Negative. Show. It's like a. It's like a. No. no. And it's like a Allura, Allura. I didn't even know people could do okay. that. Laura Gilmore could probably do that yeah. for you. Yeah. Now, it may seem strange that the cast is only just now learning about Identify, but remember, this is kind of the first time they've needed it. I can't speak for how identifying magic items worked in their Pathfinder game, but by the time they joined the uh, streamed campaign, whenever they got a new item, Tiberius would roll an Arcana check and then get the description of how the magic item worked, or they would just get a description when they bought the item from Gilmore. Going forward, they will start identifying more of their magic items through asking their friends to cast that spell. And by the time they get to campaign two, it is much better understood that the identify spell is the best way to get information about magic items. Oh, and just a fun epilogue to this sequence, Grog reattunes to the Firebrand Warhammer, and as we will continue to see throughout the rest of the campaign, whenever Grog gets his hand on a new weapon, he will ask the weapon if it can hear him to see if it talks. But honestly, could you imagine if Travis's D&D character got his hands on another talking, potentially evil sword? That would be crazy if it happened again. And again. And again, the party sets out through the forest, and thanks to Pike's terrible stealth roll, a basilisk creeps up on them, so instead they just hoof it and flee the forest. They return to the refugee camp, and it sounds like the refugees may have worked out some sort of deal to enter Kaimal. I kind of feel like this is a detail Matt included so the party could feel a little bit better about leaving these folks to their fate. 
Or maybe he just reconsidered the situation and felt like it was unrealistic for Kaimul not to eventually welcome the refugees. I don't know, but I think it's an interesting detail to include. Then the party starts talking about how to tackle the West Rune problem. Like I've said before, I love scenes like this where they just discuss the challenge in front of them, they discuss the resources they've got access to, and they start making plans. Now this is Grog's show. It's his family that's ruling West Rune, so they're leaving it to him to make the judgment call about how to handle this. And Grog's main concern is getting the locals safe. He's trying to figure out how they can get the herd out of town and then evacuate the locals. Vax and Keyleth suggest that since Grog would rule the herd if he kills Kevdak, they could just find Kevdak alone in the mansion and try to kill him there. But Vex shoots a hole through this by pointing out that Grog's victory would be worthless if nobody in the herd witnessed it. This actually reminds me a lot of a video Matt Colville made about the first Black Panther movie and the way it demonstrated how power works in communities, even in communities as apparently chaotic as the Herd of Storms or the Fremen from Dune. So they basically land on the idea that Grog will be the most appealing distraction of all. But even though Grog could distract the entire herd, the party doesn't just want to leave him while they go evacuate the villagers. Besides, if Grog can take over the herd by killing Kevdak, there would be no reason to evacuate anybody. Grog could just command the herd to leave. So that's the plan. The other party members can stay hidden and magically make Grog seem more powerful to help put on a show, and then they will actually be in place to help pull Grog out if things go wrong. Now, they do still want to cause an initial distraction and, no pun intended, thin the herd a little bit, but Scanlan can probably handle that. And they'll wait to do all of this until after they see the dragon collect its bounty, so that way they can have as much time in the city as possible before the dragon comes back, since it only comes to collect its gold every few days. But the main show is still going to be Grog versus Kevdak. The party sneaks towards Westron, and they send Vax in to where they killed Horus the Goliath. If Scanlan's going to cause a distraction, uh, he could use Horus's head. That might come in really handy. But the body isn't there anymore. Uh, you glance over, and all you see is the original farmhouse where Reginald was living. There's a the crops out there. There's the big scarecrow uh, that was in the center. There wasn't a scarecrow before. And you look over real close, and you see strung up across a haphazard wooden... No. Uh, spike oh, no. and arms out is the currently being pecked apart body of Reginald, uh, who apparently suffered the brunt of the discovery of Horace's corpse and the time that has transpired since you last left Western. I really like the way Matt handles that reveal. I love saying things like that in my games. Oh, here's the three things that you would recognize. One of those is wrong. It's a great technique that allows you to really control the flow of a scene in a really cool way. 10 out of 10. Would strongly recommend doing this every once in a while. Vax pulls the body down and brings it back to the party to point out the dangers of unintended consequences. The herd killed Reginald because they thought he killed Horus. But Percy points out that pulling down this body will signal to the tribe that Reginald was not working alone after all. Someone else is here and this will blow their cover. He doesn't say this specifically, but if we're talking about unintended consequences, pulling Reggie's body down is right up there at the top of that list. Percy basically says that they have to assume the herd will find his body missing, and this means Vox Machina has to accelerate their timetable and move tonight. And Percy says, look, that's fine, they can move tonight, they would have liked more time, but if it has to be tonight, they'll make it work. However, Pike has Speak With Dead prepared, so they can at least confirm that the herd tortured Reginald for information and find out whether or not he gave them up and how much the herd might know about them. So they cast Speak With Dead, and Reggie tells the party that he kept their secret. He told the Goliaths that he killed Horus himself. He describes the one who questioned and killed him, and it was Xanror, Kevdak's son, who Grog once beat in combat on that same fateful day he was cast out of the herd. When asked about the dangers in the city, he tells them that the tribe includes those that are fueled by rage, skilled with weapons, and those that call the elements their own. So some combination of barbarians and druids, or the NPC stat block equivalents thereof. This is the first time the party has heard any mention of magic within the herd, and that's really valuable intelligence to get. They ask about the dragon, and Horus says it came two days ago, which means it's returning tomorrow. I think Matt probably determined that because the party said they were going to wait until the dragon came before going back into the city, and so rather than Matt saying, okay, it'll be here in two days, so what do you want to do in the meantime, or inviting them to debate whether that will give them enough time, he just gives them the most advantageous timeline he can. The dragon will come tomorrow to collect its tithe, so they can prepare before it arrives if they want, but then they can take full advantage of the time window between offerings. If they want, they could spring into action the moment the dragon leaves. They probably won't, but what's most important is that they have that option, that they feel empowered to handle this however they want. That's the best timeline to give them. Then they have one last question they can ask Reginald's body, and I love this moment from Scanlan. How many more questions? Is that it or one no, more? No, no, we get five. We can have one more if we want it. What would you like us to tell your daughter? 
tell her that my life was given so she could live hers. And my memory lives in her eyes. And with that, the head just kind of lulls back a little bit, the jaw hangs open, the last of the breath in the chest, and the magic fades. Look, there may be some groups where the players might get frustrated about using a question like this if they thought there was another strategically valuable bit of information they could have gotten instead. But to me, this is the essence of role-playing. Scanlan is a father now, and it says so much about him that he's the first person to think of what kind of message Reginald might want to send to his daughter, and how he might want to be perceived in her, in her eyes. In fact, I'd argue that this question is foreshadowing for a huge chunk of Scanlan's upcoming character arc. And even without that context for why Scanlan specifically is the one to ask this question, asking this question at all helps to demonstrate the idea that the world is real, that the things that happen to the NPCs matter just as much as if they happen to player characters. That's something that is hugely important to this group of players, and when your players ask questions like this, when they treat the world like every NPC is a real person living in a real world, you've overcome one of the biggest hurdles most GMs struggle with. You've got buy-in from your players. So now the party discusses what to do next, and I just really like this moment a lot from Percy. We have to put him back. Yes. They don't know we're here. It could be anyone who could have cut him down. Why would they suspect us? I would suspect the village people first. Well, we yeah. do, and I'm the Which is actually of worse. We're going to be clever. We need to put something back up. I don't want anyone else to get hurt. He's going to he's going to save his daughter one last time. We're going to put him back up for one day. We're I going agree. to wait for the dragon to pass, and then yeah. he will be buried on his land properly with stone yes. and dirt. I'll take him. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for bringing him. This was helpful. Percy made no secret of the fact that he thought removing this body from its perch was a bad idea. But here he makes sure to articulate that he's not just being completely heartless. He also respects Reginald, and he intends to lay him to rest properly. Specifically, he evokes not just the idea of letting him rest, but he also references the rituals, burying him on his land with stone and dirt. Disposing of the body the way that their culture has agreed is right and proper. But right now they're at war, so they have to do something they don't want to do, and leave a good man to rot in the sun. Something that he is clear he finds a necessary evil, but an evil nonetheless. And by characterizing this as saving his daughter one last time, He's basically arguing that this is what Reginald would want, if he knew that the alternative meant putting the innocents in Westruin at risk of reprisal. But he also offers an olive branch to Vax, and thanks him for bringing the body. Yes, it's because they gave them useful intelligence, and that's a grim sort of logic that guides Percival, the perpetual pragmatist. But the more important point there is this, and this isn't just useful advice at the D&D table, it's also useful in life. If somebody does something that you think was dumb, not malicious, just poorly considered, then there is only so much to be gained by belaboring the point. And as long as they can put the body back, Percy's primary concern will be assuaged anyway, so there's no point in holding on to that frustration. And Percy sums all that up by thanking Vax for bringing Reginald's body, because it turned out to be useful in a way Percy was not expecting. It's just a nice moment of communication that I really wanted to highlight. Vax is able to toss Reginald back into position before the patrol comes by. It's not pretty, but it won't draw attention. The twins wait outside the mansion and watch for the dragon while everybody else spends the night in the mansion. During the night, Percy works on Vex's broom, Keyleth brews some potions, and Scanlan goes to talk to Pike and gives her a letter that he wrote. In case he dies, he wants Pike to have this letter. And he was working on this before they'd come up with the plan for Scanlan to distract the Goliaths and try to draw them out of Westrin. This is something that he started working on as soon as he had downtime in this session, because this is the first session where Ashley is back at the table. Do not open. And in parentheses, till I'm dead. That's all. Hopefully I never have to open this. I hope so too. That's all. Have a good night. Bye, Scanlan. Bye. Secrets. I close the door, I open it, and I read it. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Nobody, oh my god! Nobody look, nobody look. Don't you look. Don't you look. <laughs> Don't you look. She's still on reading it. You know what? I love her anyway. <laughs> Now this letter will be important for later, but neither Pike nor Scanlan will ever read this letter out loud for the audience. Sam does eventually read it on stream after the campaign is over, but that video is no longer online due to unrelated reasons. I do still have a copy of that clip where he read the letter, so I will talk about it in a future episode, but 
Not this one, not just yet. I think it's a little bit more fun to savor that mystery for a bit longer. As the dawn hits, Vax and Vex see the black dragon Umbrasil fly down from the mountain Gat Shadow and circle over Western a few times to remind everyone that it rules the city. I'm sure everyone totally forgot, my dude. Good reminder. The dragon hits the drop-off location next to the city and scoops up the cart full of loot. Then, on its way out, it also snatches up one of the herd members who dropped off the horde, and his buddies watch impotently as he gets carried away to the dragon's lair. Vex theorizes that the Goliaths are running out of loot for the horde, and the dragon is pissed about that. Vax suspects the Goliaths might not be wild about this arrangement anymore, if it's costing them herd members. It's a long shot, but if Grog can take over the herd, then they might be angry enough at the dragon that they'd be willing to join in the fight. If they can be trusted. So now they iron out their plan, and then they get to work. Keyleth goes underground and starts digging a trench, leaving just a thin layer of earth above, so no one would know the trench was there until they stepped on it and fell into it. These pits wind up being almost 200 feet deep, so boy oh boy, anybody who falls into that is going to have a bad time. Scanlan turns invisible and walks into Westrun, and as soon as he does, Matt switches from either the Mysterious or Tension playlist, whichever one he was using to capture the apprehension of planning or resting near a dragon's lair, and he switches to the Small Battle playlist, which is ideal for relatively low-stakes action. I'll make another video in the future about music at the table, and I promise these terms and titles will make a lot more sense. But I like this a lot, because whenever you do this, it does change the mood of the table. They're no longer in planning mode. Now they're in starting to execute the plan mode. There are still things the rest of them can do to prep while Scanlan enters to cause a distraction. They can still prepare for the squad of angry herd members who they expect to storm out of the gate in a few minutes. For example, Keyleth polymorphs Percy into a crow and then wild shapes into one herself, and the two of them wait on the city walls in case they need to get to Scanlan quickly or get out of town quickly. But changing the music makes it clear that they can't do any more prep that would take a long, long time. The countdown clock has started. As Scanlan enters town, Matt also describes that there are three guards at this gate, one Goliath and two humans. He says that these are probably members of the other tribe that the Herd of Storms absorbed. And this is really useful because it helps remind the players that not everybody in the Herd is a Goliath. They're still going to call them all Goliaths, I'm probably still going to call them all Goliaths when we're talking about the group as a whole in very general terms, but making sure that a faction isn't just a monolith of one culture or ancestry does help avoid some uncomfortable framing that has plagued this hobby for decades. It also makes these factions feel more authentic and more nuanced. If you remember that not everybody in this herd is exactly the same, it actually gets easier to imagine that not all of them might feel the same way. Like. I don't think this becomes a plot point, so it's not a spoiler, but you could imagine that the members of the herd that are not Goliaths from when Grog was a member might not care as much if they saw Grog roll up. You could also imagine that not all of them might feel the same way about a dragon snatching up a herd member when collecting today's tithe. It's just a useful technique that helps add depth to your enemy factions with very little work. Matt narrates some damage Scanlan sees as he walks around, and interestingly, there are no people on the streets. Makes sense. It's been attacked by dragons and conquered by goliaths. Nobody is exactly running down to the market for a basket of eggs. Matt also narrates that the Temple of Arathis has been defiled, but from inside, Scanlan saw a set of eyes looking at him as a small figure peered out and then shut the door. A small figure who seemed to see Scanlan, despite him being invisible. Matt's dropping some sort of hint, but Scanlan chooses to keep going. Even if his cover's been blown, He's got to finish the mission. The town square has been turned into a defensive position with barricades made of furniture and weapons lashed together. Some heads are on spikes here, including the Margrave, who used to rule Westron, and the head of Loren the Bear, another adventurer the party scrapped with back in their pit fighting days. Scanlan goes to the steps where he sees the most people, the most uh, enemy combatants, and casts Thunder Wave. What Sam didn't realize was that invisibility ends when he attacks or casts a spell, so now he's visible. And I want to highlight this moment. Cast a spell? Yeah. Yeah. Even though it's a concentration spell? Yeah, you can cast other instantaneous spells, but as soon as you cast a spell, you become visible. High, what? High level and invis improved invisibility, stuff like that, is the one that remains. Oh, well, I'm fucked then. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Just as we... I'll say, do you have greater invisibility? No. I can cast it at a greater level, but no, I don't have greater invisibility. Yeah, at that moment, you suddenly become <laughs> visible. Roll with it. Roll Hi. with it. Hi, guys. Hi. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Come you on, man. It's not my turn. It's their turn. It. It's surprise it. round. They weren't expecting it. Roll initiative right now. Oh, oh shit. shit. Oh, my no. God. Scanlan, run. It seems to me like Matt was going to offer Sam a lifeline. He was probably going to say, if you have greater invisibility, you could cast that before entering this area, so you could remain invisible for one minute even though you cast a spell. He was going to let him retcon that. Again, one of those moments where I would agree, Matt is not being a harsh DM. But Sam did not have that spell. So Matt basically has to let the chips fall where they may. But that's the second thing I want to highlight here. 
It doesn't seem like Sam is upset by this. Sure, it's not what he planned, and he missed that detail of the spell. And he is asking for clarification, kind of questioning, trying to figure out what went wrong. We've seen that happen a hundred times on this show. Someone does a thing, and Matt offers a ruling, and then the player questions or potentially tries to correct Matt's ruling if they feel he's missed something. And sometimes that can lead to the player feeling frustrated or bummed out. But Sam Regal is not bummed out by what just happened. Because Sam is a messy bitch who lives for drama. Okay, that's not really the D&D term for it. What I meant to say was, Sam does not dislike failure. He enjoys it when a natural one might make things worse for them. Because to him, that's part of the fun. The risk of failure making things more complicated. I actually think this is one of the reasons people maybe thought he didn't care about the campaign as much in the early days. Because he did not seem to live and die by the dice rolls like everyone else did. If Scanlan rolled low on stealth or whatever, Sam always just rolled with it. And I think that's just an awesome attitude to have. It's honestly why I think Sam is really an excellent D&D player. Because he's willing to fail, if that's how things go. He's more likely to make brave and heroic decisions rather than try to cut off every possible chance of failure. Scanlan beats the enemies in initiative, and he says he is going to cast Dimension Door back into the temple, where he saw that small person saw him when he was invisible. Matt says it's too far, it's a thousand feet away, and the spell's range is half of that, but he could teleport closer to it. So yeah, that's what he does. He teleports to a random place between him and the temple, out of sight of the thugs he just hit. The bad guys ring the warning bell in the center of town, and Vox Machina hears this from outside the town, so at least they're now kind of in the loop. I mean, I do feel like they jump to the conclusion that the plan has gone wrong way too quickly. Scanlan's plan was to distract people and draw them out, so warning bells might mean that it's working. Anyway, Scanlan casts Dimension Door again into the temple and discovers approximately 30 survivors huddled inside. One of the survivors is Scanlan's old mentor, Dr. Dranzel. They're, they themselves look a little worse for wear, and he looks over his shoulder and says, Why am I oh, Shit, Kaylee, weren't you just talking about him yesterday? <gasps> oh, as, shit! As your daughter stands behind him, kind of like holding two of the children, uh, trying to protect him as you appeared, she looks up at you and goes, Oh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and that's where we'll end tonight's game. Oh, perfect! And yeah, that's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back in two weeks to discuss episode 51, Test of Pride. What happens when Scanlan reunites with Kaylee and Grog reunites with Kevdak? Some great lessons for our own game, that is for damn sure. Before we wrap up today, I really want to thank you, not just for watching, but for being so fantastic. January was a really difficult month for me. Personally, I lost two grandparents in less than two weeks, and I have so appreciated the amazing support of this community. It's been really wonderful. Speaking of people in the community being amazing, thank you so much to Summer for sending these items off of my wish list. Uh, this is the Exquisite Exandria Cookbook and the Critical Role comic about the origin of one of the members of the Mighty Nine from Campaign 2, Caleb Widogast. I'm really looking forward to both of these. They should be really fun to read, and I already have some video ideas for each of these as well. If you want to support the channel, you do not have to get anything off of my wish list. Very kind of you, but not necessary. Uh, just like the video and subscribe and ring the bell and leave a comment. Let's feed the hungry beast that we call the algorithm. If you want to help me take this series weekly, consider supporting me on Patreon or join as a YouTube member. Come and hang out with other amazing members of this community in my Discord server and sign up for my newsletter, and all those links are in the doobly-doo below. Click here for my video about making paper handouts for my games. I almost started a fire, and you can find out how. Until next time, play fair and have fun.